Brian Wilson, Mary Catherine Hamm, Brian Neiman, today's newsmakers, and you, the morning majority. AM 630. 707 here on the morning majority in WMAL. Brian Neiman, Susan Fariccio from the Washington Examiner this morning. Thanks for coming in. Very happy to be here. It's great to have you here. Brian and Mary Catherine will be back next week. KT McFarland's on the line, Fox News National Security Analyst. Did you have a good Thanksgiving, KT? I did. Fantastic. I tell you that I sat around the, the dinner table with a lot of uh, current and former DOD employees, and uh, they were a little bit worried because of these budget cuts. I'm curious to get your take on what you're hearing. What what concerns those in the Defense Department the most about these cuts? Well, there are a couple of things. It's a 10% across the board cut if you average it over 10 years. Mm-hmm. If you look at it over the first year, it really ends up being 18%. Um, and presumably, the president is going to say, okay, we're going to exempt military pay and benefits. Um, because it's hard to think that the military is going to take anywhere from a 10 to a 15, an 18 percent cut in pay right. when everybody else doesn't. So then what it means is that all those cuts have to be taken in what are called line items, which means it's things like equipment, readiness. I mean, I think it is, it is such a significant cut that if it were to happen, it will at, it'll force the military to say, okay, we're going to give up certain missions. We're going to give up Europe. We're going to give up having a Marine Corps, you know, things of that significant. Something big. Because the problem is that most people, most people's minds think, oh, well, we're coming from, from Afghanistan and Iraq. We'll use that savings there. Well, that money was never part of the defense budget, and it won't be part of the savings. Um, the savings from those wars will not accrue to the defense budget. And I, I've heard that this will also potentially require a reduction in our armed forces oh, overall. Oh, for sure. For sure. Without question. Um, in the numbers of people. I've got, this weekend for Thanksgiving weekend, I've got a daughter who's a naval officer in San Diego. She's brought some of her Navy friends home, and they're already, um, in this in the last several months, the enlisted personnel, if they've been in for 5 to 15 years, have to start um, making their case to be allowed to stay in the military. And they're all talking about the presumption that the, the force will be downsized significantly as a result. Art, right, you use the word if, if these cuts happen. Do you yeah. believe that it can be reversed and that uh, Congress well, perhaps... the problem. I mean, everybody's saying, oh, well, we're going to have an election in 2012, we'll yeah. reverse this, because it doesn't really apply to two th- until 2013. The problem is the military is a big ship, and it's, a hard, it's hard to turn that ship around quickly. So they've got to start making those cuts now, and the worry in the military is that who's walking out the door as a result of this? Mm-hmm. If they think that, oh, gosh, we're going to have our force reduced by 10, 15 percent, I want to make sure I'm the first guy out there so I can get a job. And so the most experienced and the very best talent leaves first. And that takes a decade to repair. But, you know, I have a bigger problem with it, which is what sing- signal does that send to the world? I mean, not only can we not govern ourselves, it seems, but to say that America is going to significantly reduce its military presence around the world, that says, okay, all those guys out there, friend and foe, who thought our best days were over, here's proof that you're right. What do you think of, of uh, Rick Perry's call that Leon Panetta should should resign over this? Well, I think that's Leon Panetta's decision, um, not Rick Perry's decision to make. I think every, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer that you resign if you think things are serious enough, but that's something that Leon Panetta can make that decision himself. Well, he's, he's made it pretty clear is, that, he doesn't like, that he doesn't like it and thinks he doesn't it's like different. it, but here's, yeah. here's the other problem. If the president forces it on him because of the president's inaction and, and unwillingness to step up to the plate and man up and take some credit or, or potential fault for things that go badly, then who's the best person there to implement right. these devastating cuts? That's the other side of the argument. But I, I'm really, you know, watching these debates, first of all, I'm struck by a couple of things. These guys are getting pretty good at debating. And the dirty little secret in Washington is Obama's a lousy debater. He's real good at reading the teleprompter, but he's not very good on his feet. And then the second thing that strikes me is that all these debates and all the political you know, polling and all that, what it really reveals is Americans have, we've lost confidence in ourselves. You know, we've sort of lost the mojo. As, as FDR said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And we're starting to get fearful. And we're, we're doubting ourselves. And why? I think it's because we believe we have a president who doesn't believe in American exceptionalism. In fact, he said 
that British exceptionalism is just like Greek exceptionalism, is like American exceptionalism. He doesn't believe in it. And because he doesn't believe in it, we don't believe in it. And because we don't believe in it, we're in this funk where we don't think we can turn things around. And we think we're in the worst of all possible times in the history of this country. This is nothing compared to the Civil War that Lincoln faced. This is nothing compared to the Great Recession and Depression and the Cold War. You know, so we suck it up. Stop whining, President Obama, and get on with it. What do you think of the candidates? There there have been two foreign policy debates now. Who do you think really is shown during these debates, and who do you think really showed that they don't know anything much about foreign policy? Well, what I'm thinking is, in watching this last debate, they all did pretty well. Clearly, the ones who've not been as experienced in this in their previous incarnations in their in their careers so far have clearly read their briefing books, and they all seem to spew a lot of facts and figures at this latest debate. And I think these debates are kind of like watching Dancing with the Stars mm-hmm. or, or NASCAR, reality TV. You kind of watch to see who screws up. Yeah, right. You know, who's going to get voted off the island sure. this week? And the odd thing is that they've all done pretty well in this last debate. Every one of them had a moment. I mean, uh, Romney talked very articulately and eloquently about American exceptionalism. Um, the Santorum talked, and, and certainly Michelle Bachman, talked extremely well about Pakistan. Well, well, Herman Cain talked about missile defense. Well, what do you make of Ron Paul? So many people love his policy of non-intervention. And he, he's he got a, a very loyal following. Yes. And the things he says during those foreign policy debates probably don't sit well with a lot of Republicans about let's just ignore you know Iran and their potential for nuclear weapons and let Israel fight its own battles. What do you think of someone like that and the fact that he gets pretty, you know, he does pretty well, well in the polls? Well, it's very comforting. You know, it's like eating... A peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Um, you know, it's very comforting. It's America of the good old days in Campbell's chicken noodle soup and grilled cheese sandwiches. It's, and mac and it's, cheese. It's, it's like it's exactly. nostalgic. It's, oh, let's go back to the good old days when we didn't have to engage in the world. And, you know, we've done that before. We've retreated there after World War One. We did it after Vietnam. The problem with, with the idea of let's come home, America, mm-hmm. pull up the, uh, the drawbridge and hide behind the moat, um, is that the world isn't like that anymore because the world is a global world. And I don't think that we we're, we can do that because, for example, who cares if there's another war in the Middle East, right? There always are wars in the Middle East. What I care about is Iran gets nuclear weapons, everybody in the Middle East gets nuclear weapons, then the next war in the Middle East, because there always is one, no. goes nuclear. I, I always feel that this is a war, the long war, the, uh, the war against uh, radical Islam is going to be won by our spy agencies. So I'm a little worried when I see this report that 12 spies, whether they're CIA or other, have been captured. Yeah, you um, should be afraid of this one. This uh, is a real thing. Th- this, this seems legitimate to you? Yeah. What happened six months ago is the Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, you know, the terrorist group very closely affiliated with Iran, um, they announced that they picked up two CIA spies, they call them. And since then, there's been an unraveling of several spy networks in the region. Now, why do we, and, and whether they're U.S. Or, or Israeli Mossad spies, whether they're, you know, guys who went to Princeton and joined the CIA, or whether they're paid informants out of the, out of the Middle East, um, What's, everybody needs intelligence now. The single most important thing in the long war or the single most important thing in looking at what's happening in Iran and its nuclear program is intelligence. It's the one thing we don't have. Right. So spy networks are really important. Finding out what's going on there yep. is what's really important. Because what are the, you look at back and think, what's one of the biggest mistakes we've made in the last 10 years? We, it, we underestimated the rise of radical Islam and al-Qaeda. And we overestimated weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Why did we do that? Because we didn't have intelligence. Right. All right, KT. Good to have you on as always. We appreciate it.